Hi guys, I'm Mr. Costillo here. I wanted to um, begin our first short story with you guys as a video because number one, I'm not quite sure how this is going to work. So I'm testing out a few things because I think there's difficulty in reading it with you guys, having you guys read it out loud, having me read it out loud. So I'm going to try this first because I, I did this a little bit back in March and April with my uh, juniors and my sophomores that I taught last term. But what I want to do is I want to introduce you guys to um, the short story, read a little bit of it, and kind of key you guys in on what it is exactly that you should be getting on your free response journal for this one. Okay, so first short story we're going to read is called Top Man by James Ramsey Ullman. So as a hook, have you ever been in close competition with someone? Did you end up respecting them or harboring some jealousy? I'm sure you have. For me, oh, man, I mean, I've had competitors here and there, but my brother, I can think of one. Um, there were times when we got into fights a lot of times, and I ended up respecting him. I mean, there were times when we didn't, we hated each other's guts, but, you know, it's going to be a part of the story, so... Let me just have you think of that, the, 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 the competition you have with people and what, how that, what that leads to. Okay, so we're going to read the text closely to determine what it says. We're going to evaluate evidence, textual evidence to support a theme that you'll have to come up with. Analyze the development and offer of an author's claim or, or theme. Analyze the impact of figurative language. Make logical references. Remember, your free response journals need to address the elements of fiction but notice how there's the common ones setting character conflict um point of view symbols plot and then also put down cross-cultural encounters why you'll notice that the common thread for each poem story and book idea what it is that we're going to read it will come from the other someone and what i mean by that someone from a different culture a different race a different gender a different identity okay the 21st century world is increasingly more global, meaning there's more that we should know about those that don't look and act like us and don't live close to us at all. Okay. Um, so we'll get to the documentation. Um, this is the MLA documentation, but we'll get to it later. So this is the story right here. I'm going to start it. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It is 10 pages, so don't worry. We'll do this together. Okay. But as I read, I want to point out again the things that if you, if, if I were you, I'm probably going to tell you this when you guys read this, but take out your free response journal now. And since I'm going to record this and play and have it linked to our Canvas page, you guys can come back and work on the free response journal later, or you can work on it as I read it. Um, but I would come back to it later because remember, you're doing a couple things. You're looking at uh, how to portray this in an artistic way, in an interesting way, um, um, using plot lines, using sketches, using quotes. Okay, Top Man. The setting of Top Man is essential to the story. This, in fact, is the very purest form of story in which a person is in conflict with the environment. As you read, Notice how the mountain is even given human characteristics, so that it seems to become a character in the story. The gorge bent. The walls fell suddenly away, and we came out of the edge of a bleak, boulder-strewn valley. And there it was. Osborne saw it first. He had been leading the column, threading his way slowly among the huge rock masses of the gorge's mouth. Then he came to the first floor, flat, bare place, and stopped. He neither pointed nor cried out, but every man behind him knew instantly what it was. The long file sprang taut like a jerked rope. As swiftly as we could, but in, in complete silence, we came into the open ground where Osborne stood and raised our eyes with his. In the records of the Indian top, top, topographic survey, it says, Calpertha, a mountain in the Himalayas, altitude 28,900 feet, the highest peak in British India and fourth highest in the world also known as K3, a tertiary formation of sedimentary limestone. All right, so you have setting. So how are you going to portray the setting? Maybe draw a mountain, obviously. Uh, you also have point of view, very obviously, with the with this word right here, we. Okay, so you're getting a couple elements of fiction already. 
There were men among us who had spent months of their lives, in some cases years, reading, thinking, planning about what now lay before us. But at that moment, statistics and geology, knowledge, thought, and plans were as remote and forgotten as the faraway western cities from which we had come. We were men bereft of everything but eyes, everything but the single electric perception. There it was. All right. Um, you don't have to write this quote down. But there's some good context here, okay? They're all coming from different places. They're all sort of being under the spell of the mountain that they are, that they see before them. Before us, the valley stretched away into miles of rocky desolation. To right and left, it was bounded by low ridges, which, as the eye followed them, slowly mounted and drew closer together until the valley was no longer a valley at all, but a narrowing, rising corridor between the cliffs. What happened then I can describe only as a single stupendous crash of music. At the end of the corridor and above it, so far above it that it shut out half the sky, hung the blinding white mass of K3. It was like the many pictures I had seen, and at the same time utterly unlike them. The shape was there, and the familiar distinguishing features, the sweeping skirt of glaciers, the monstrous vertical precipices of the face, and the jagged ice light line of the east ridge. Finally, the symmetrical summit pyramid that transfixed the sky. But whereas in the pictures the mountain had always seemed unreal, a dream image of cloud, snow, and crystal, it was now no longer an image at all. It was a mass, solid, imminent, appalling. Okay, there's again, this description is so rich of the mountain right here. So I would pick something from here again to kind of describe how figuratively he's looking at it, the, the narrator, right? Uh, we were still too far away to see the windy whipping of its snow plumes, this is alliteration, or to hear the cannonading of its avalanches, but in that sudden silent moment, every man of us was for the first time aware of it, not as a picture in his mind, but as a thing, an antagonist. For all its 28,000 feet of lofty grandeur, it seemed somehow less to tower than to crouch. A white hooded giant, secret and remote, but living, living and on guard. Okay, notice this personification right here of, right, how um, how they see it as a living thing and how they see it as something that it's not a mountain at all, um, okay, but like something different. I turned my eyes away from, from the dazzling glare and looked at my companions. Osborne still stood a little in front of the others. He was absolutely motionless. His young face tense and shining, his eyes devouring the mountain as a lover's might devour the face of his beloved. Uh, that's a simile. One could feel in the very set of his body the overwhelming desire that swelled in him to act, to come to grips, to conquer. A little behind him were ranged the other men of the expedition, Randolph, our leader, Whitmer and Johns, Dr. Schlapp and Bixler. All were still, their eyes cast upward. Off to one side a little stood Nace, the Englishman, the only one among us who was not staring at K3 for the first time. He'd been the last to come up out of the George and stood now with his arms folded on his chest, squinting at the great peak he had known so long and fought so tirelessly and fiercely. His lean British face under its mask of stubble and windburn were expressionless. His lips were a colorless line and his eyes seemed almost shut. Behind the sahibs ranged the porters bent over their staffs, their brown seamed faces straining upward from beneath their loads. Okay, in this paragraph right here, guys, there's a lot of characters being introduced. There's also indir there's also some in some direct characterization, okay? Of who? If you're paying attention, it's of Nace. For a long while no one spoke or moved. The only sounds between earth and sky were the soft hiss of our breathing and the pounding of our hearts. Through the long afternoon we wound slowly between the great boulders of the valley and at sundown pitched camp in the bed of a dried up stream. The porters ate their rations in silence, wrapped themselves in their blankets, and fell asleep under the stars. The rest of us, as our custom, sat close about the fire and blazed the blaze in the circle of tents, discussing the events of the day and the plans for the next. It was a flawlessly clear Himalayan night, and K3 teared up into the blackness like a monstrous sentinel lighted from within. There was no wind, but a great tide of cold air crept from the valley and from the valley from the ice fields above, penetrating our clothing, pressing gently against the canvas of the tents. 
Another night and two, and we'll be needing the sleeping bags, commented, commented Randolph. Osborne nodded. We could use them tonight, would be my guess. Randolph turned to Nace. What do you say, Martin? The Englishman puffed at his pipe a moment. Would rather think it would be better to wait, he said at last. Wait? Why? Osborne jerked his head. Well, it gets pretty nippy eye up, you know. I've seen it 30 below at 25,000 on the East Ridge. Longer we wait for the bags, better acclimate you will get. Osborne snorted. A lot of good being acclimated will do if we have frozen feet. Easy, Paul, easy, cautioned Randolph. Seems to me Martin's right. Osborne bit his lip but said nothing. The other man entered the conversation, and soon it had veered to other matters. The weather, the porters, the pack animals, routes, camps, and strategy. The inevitable and exhaustible topics of the climber's world. There were all kinds of men among the eight of us, men with great diversity of background and interest. Say a Randolph, whom the Alpine Club had named the leader of our expedition, had for years been a well-known explorer and lecturer. Now in his middle fifties, he was no longer equal to the grueling physical demands of high climbing, but served as planner and organizer of the enterprise. Whitmer was a Seattle lawyer who had recently made a name for himself by a series of difficult ascents in the coast range of British Columbia. Johns was an Alaskan, a fantastically strong, able sourgo, who had been ranger in the U.S. Forest Service and had accompanied many fa famous Alaskan expeditions. Schlapp was a practicing physician from Milwaukee, Bixler a government meteorologist with a talent for photography. I, at the time, was an assistant professor of geology at the Eastern University. Okay, if you notice anything, they're all from different backgrounds, so there's that. Um... Finally, and preeminently, there were Osborne and Nace. I say preeminently because, even at this time when we had been together at a party for a little more than a month, I believe all of us realized that there were the two key men of our venture. None to my knowledge ever expressed it in words, but the convic conviction was there, nevertheless, that if any of us were eventually to stand on the hitherto unconquered summit of K3, it would be one of them. Or both, they were utterly dissimilar men. Osborne was 23 and a year out of college, a compact, buoyant mass of energy and high spirits. He seemed to be wholly unaffected by either the physical or mental hazards of mountaineering and had already, by virtue of many spectacular ascents of the Alps and Rockies, won a reputation as the most skilled and audacious of young American climbers. Okay, so now you've, you're getting a little bit of more context behind two specific people. This guy's the first. Okay. And next is going to be Nace, which was, where was I? I lost my place. Compact point, okay. Nace, right here, was in his 40s, lean, taciturn, introspective, an offic official of the Indian Civil Service. He had explored and climbed in the Himalayas for 20 years. He had been a member of all five of the unsuccessful British expeditions to K3, and in his last attempt had attained to within 500 feet of the summit, the highest point which any man had reached on the unconquered giant. This had been the famous tragic attempt in which his fellow climber and lifelong friend, Captain Furness, had slipped and fallen 10,000 feet to his death. Nace rarely mentioned his name. But on the steel head of his ice axe were engraved the words, To Martin from John. Okay, this is probably important. If fate were to grant that the axe of any one of us should be planted upon the summit of K3, I hoped it would be his. Okay, this is probably an important quote. I, I would probably write this in, put this in my pre-response journal. Such were the men who had huddled about the fire in the deep, still cold of that Himalayan night. There were many differences among us in temperament, as well as in background. In one or two cases, notably that of Osborne and Nace, there had already been a certain amount of friction and as the venture continued and the struggles had hardships of the actual ascent began, I it would, I knew, increase. But differences weren't important. What mattered, all that mattered, is that our purpose was one, to conquer the monster of rock and ice that now loomed above us in the night, to stand for a moment where no man, no living thing had ever stood before. To that end, we had come from halfway across the world, the world away, across oceans and continents to the fastness of inner Asia. To that end, we were prepared to endure cold, exhaustion, and danger, even to the very last extremity of human endurance. Why? There is no answer. And at the same time, every man knew, among us knew the answer. Every man who had ever looked upon a great mountain and felt the fever in his blood to climb and conquer knows the answer. 
George Lee Mallory, greatest of mountaineers, expressed it once and for all when he had asked why he wanted to climb Everest. I want to climb it, said Mallory, because it's there. Okay, there's great lines in this whole paragraph. From here to here, I would write any of these down. Okay, uh, probably the last one, but I mean, the difference is it's a, it's a great paragraph. Day after day, we crept on the upward, on and upward. The naked desolation of the valley was unrelieved by any motion, color, or sound. And as we progressed, it was like being trapped at the bottom of a deep well or in a sealed court between great skyscrapers. Soon we were thinking of the ascent of the shining mountain, not only as an end of, in and of itself, but as an escape. In our nightly discussions around the fire, our conversation narrowed more and more to the immediate problems confronting us. And during them... I began to realize that the tension between Osborne and Ace went deeper than I had first surmised. Okay, this is probably good because it's conflict right here. A major piece of conflict in the story. Probably write this down. There was rarely any outright argument between them, and they were both far too able mountain men to disagree on fundamentals. But I saw that at that um, at that saw that at almost every turn they were rubbing each other the wrong way. It was a matter of personalities, chiefly. Osborne was talkative, enthusiastic, optimistic, always chafing to the up and all, up and at it, always wanting to talk, take the short, straight line to the give, given point. Mace, on the other hand, was matter-of-fact, cautious, slow. He was the apostle of trial and error and watchful waiting. Because of this fat, sorry, because of this f for far greater experience and intimate knowledge of K3, Randolph almost invariably followed his advice, other than Osborne's when a difference of opinion arose. The younger man usually capitulated with good grace, but it, but I could tell he was irked. Okay, two good words there you guys could totally use, capitulated and irked, if you want to write them in your free response journal, if you don't know what they mean at all in the context. Um, during the days in the valley, I had few occasions to talk privately with, night, with either of them, and only once did either mention the other in any but the most casual manner. Even then, the remarks they made seemed unimportant, and I remember them only in the view of what happened later. My conversation with Osborne occurred first. It was while we were on the march, and Osborne, who was directly beneath, behind me, came up suddenly to my side. You're a geologist, Frank, he began with a preamble. What do you think of Nace's theory about, about the ridge? What theory? I asked. He believes we should traverse under it from the glacier up. Says the ridge itself is too exposed. Uh, it looks pretty mean through the telescope. But it's been done before. He's done it himself. All right, it's tough. I'll admit that. But a decent climber can make it in half the time the traverse will take. Nace knows the traverse is longer, I said. But he seems certain it will be much easier for us. Easier for him, what he means. Osborne paused, looked moodily at the ground. He was a great climber in his day, and it's a shame a man can't be honest enough with himself to know when he's through. He fell silent, and a moment later dropped back into his place. Sorry, his line. All right, I'm going to, this is a lot so far, so I'm going to stop, okay? And we'll pick up here, uh, log back into our canvas.